Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, the 12th Annual Asia Conference um, being held virtually. Today is day two in our series on human trafficking in Asia. We would like to thank our speakers and um, attendees for joining us from different parts of the world today. Um, Alana and I are part of a team of about 10 or 12 students who are graduate students at the University of Essex's Human Rights Center. And uh, we have been organizing this event for about a few months. The event was originally meant to happen um, in March and had to be called off at the very last moment because of COVID. So we thank our speakers for being patient with us and um, accepting our invitation to join at this virtual event. Um, the theme for this year's event is human trafficking in Asia, and it was inspired well, inspired by um, a case that I'm sure a lot of us in the UK are very familiar with. Um, in October of 2019, 39 Vietnamese people were found dead in a lorry in Essex. One of our speakers will be talking more about this today. Um, but it really resonated with a lot of us from Asian countries who are acutely aware of human trafficking being a very prevalent issue. And um, we are happy that some of our speakers will be delving further into this issue with specific um, focuses from different Asian countries. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so for those of you who weren't able to join us for Tuesday's event, uh, then we focused a bit more on broader and international perspectives to human rights, uh, to human trafficking, whereas today we're going to be looking more specifically at the national level. Uh, we've aimed to have representation from people working in a variety of different regions throughout Asia, so South Asia, Thailand, Nepal, and Vietnam. Uh, as well, we wanted people coming from dis different disciplines, so we have people from non-governmental organizations, uh, journalism, and academia, who each can offer their unique uh, perspectives and approaches to the issue. Uh, the way the structure is going to work for today is that we have four presenters who will each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, followed by a brief question and answer period where we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, yeah, so to begin, uh, either Anila or myself will give a brief introduction to the presenter. Uh, if you'd like to look at a more thorough explanation of their extensive and uh, impressive bios, we'll include a document uh, in the chat. Um, but yeah, so for time's sake, without further ado, I'd like to first introduce Hannah Bondi. Uh, Hannah works as SDG uh, Sustainable Development Goal 8.7 Program Officer at Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, working on strategy development, network building, and program implementation. She's also currently pursuing a Master of Science in Countering Organized Crime and Terrorism at University College London. So go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd just like to start by saying a big thank you to the Essex Human Rights Centre for organising this important panel discussion. So I work in the London office of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative, and we're an independent not-for-profit organisation working for the practical realisation of human rights in the Commonwealth. In the London office, we work specifically on contemporary forms of slavery, and our work is twofold. We've launched the Commonwealth 8.7 Network, which is a group of over 60 local civil society organizations who work to counter contemporary forms of slavery in their nations. And secondly, we work in partnership with the Mindaroo Foundation to conduct research on modern slavery and human trafficking in the Commonwealth, as well as government response. And this is what I'll be talking about today. Our upcoming report analyzes Commonwealth government's response to different facets of modern slavery and human trafficking. And we use a conceptual fr framework which assesses legislative and policy responses in line with five milestones. The first milestone looks at survivors of human trafficking, how they're identified and how they're supported. The second milestone looks at criminal justice mechanisms and how they function. And the third milestone looks at coordination on the national level as well as the regional level. The fourth milestone examines risk factors that enable modern slavery and human trafficking, such as attitudes, social systems and institutions. And the fifth and final milestone looks at supply chains and how governments and businesses are addressing human trafficking within these supply chains. So what I'll be talking about today is how these five milestones have been measured in Asian Commonwealth countries, of which there are eight, 
These include Bangladesh, Brunei Dar es Salaam, India, Malaysia, the Maldives, Pakistan, Singapore, and Sri Lanka. But before I get onto these five milestones, there were three key issues that were relevant for all our research on all Asian countries in the Commonwealth. The first was systematic inequality and discrimination, which put certain groups at disproportionate risk of human trafficking. For example, in India, individuals from certain castes are disproportionately represented among those in bonded labor. In Bangladesh, the Rohingya population continues to be extremely vulnerable to exploitation due to a, due to a lack of access to formal state services. Women and girls were a particular at-risk group for certain types of exploitation, namely sexual exploitation and trafficking. And child marriage is particularly prevalent in the Asian Commonwealth, with rates of child marriage higher in South Asia than any other Commonwealth region. The second key issue was data gaps within the region. Robust research and data is crucial for ensuring that policy decisions and interventions are evidence-based. Yet there was no country that had evidence that it is funding or facilitating prevalence or estimation research on human trafficking, and only Pakistan, Singapore, and Sri Lanka have evidence that even non-prevalence research on human trafficking is being funded or facilitated. Although many countries have relevant legislation aimed at tackling modern slavery and human trafficking, another key issue we found was that protections are limited for certain groups namely migrant workers and informal workers, despite the prevalence of these workers in Asia. So looking now at our first milestone of supporting survivors, CHRI's re research found that identification and support for survivors of human trafficking is currently inadequate across all eight Asian countries within the Commonwealth, and there is a need to strengthen identification mechanisms. Although five countries have evidence of national campaigns informing the public about how to identify and report victims, this was not always conducted regularly. And as such, no country has shown an increase in cases of human trafficking being reported by the public. Most countries do not have clear guidelines on identifying victims, and only Singapore has a national referral mechanism. This is the mechanism by which victims are identified and referred to relevant services. All countries have reporting mechanisms available. Bangladesh, Brunei, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka ran national campaigns informing the public of how to identify and report victims. However, despite these campaigns, no country has shown an increase in the cases of human trafficking reported by the public. Alongside this, all countries have training for police and frontline first responders on how to identify victims. Yet this ran into a similar issue. No country has evidence that first responders mostly succeed in identifying victims. On support for victims and survivors, we found that this was unfortunately generally inadequate across the region. While all countries have some support services for victims, these frequently do not meet victims' needs, particularly over the longer term, and no country evaluates its victim support services. In Bangladesh, Brunei, India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, physical and mental health support are not available to all. Turning now to the second milestone of criminal justice, our research found that even when legislation does exist, criminal justice mechanisms are not fun functioning effectively throughout the region. There are gaps in international commitments from all countries in the Asia Commonwealth, and access to justice remains a significant area for improvement. In terms of international commitments, an encouraging step forward was Bangladesh's accession to the 2000 UN Trafficking Protocol in September of 2019. However, no country in the Asia Commonwealth has ratified either the International Labour Organization's 2011 Domestic Workers' Convention or the 2014 Forced Labour Protocol. Looking at national legislation, all countries criminalize forced labor and human trafficking, except the Maldives, which does not criminalize human trafficking, and cases of forced labor have mistakenly been charged as labor law violations. The strength of national leg legislation varies, as does its implementation, which needs to be significant, significantly, significantly improved across all countries. Only Malaysia, Pakistan, and Singapore criminalize forced marriage, 
and only India has raised the age of marriage to 18. In terms of access to justice for victims and survivors, we found that this was an area for key improvement. Namely, only Bangladesh and the Maldives have laws which explicitly recognize that victims should not be treated as criminals for conduct which occurred while under the control of traffickers. There is evidence that all countries except the Maldives have treated victims as criminals for such conduct. No countries currently provide visas to stay in the country, which are not dependent on the victim participating in the court process. This is particularly concerning as victims may wish not to testify due to trauma or fears over safety. And without a visa to remain in the country, they may be, be at risk of re-exploitation or re-trafficking if deported to their country of origin. Awareness of the issues surrounding human trafficking among key actors in the justice system is crucial in ensuring that victim-centered access to justice can be achieved in practice. Six countries have specialized law, law enforcement units, but there is evidence in India and Pakistan that these units do not have the resources to operate effectively. Only India and Malaysia have evidence of training for the judiciary and prosecutors on a systematic and regular basis. Importantly, systemic discrimination prevents certain groups from accessing criminal justice mechanisms. A prime example of this is in Bangladesh. There is evidence that Rohingya trafficking victims cannot access protective services and that the Bangladesh High Court did not consider trafficking claims filed by the Rohingya. On our third milestone of coordination, our research found that national coordination mechanisms are weak across the region and cross-border collaboration is particularly crucial due to the high prevalence of migration for work. Six countries have a national action plan to coordinate the national response and allocate responsibility in terms of human trafficking. However, only Bangladesh releases reports on its actions to combat human trafficking, and only Malaysia has evidence that activities in the National Action Plan are fully funded. Furthermore, no country has any independent entity in place to monitor the effect effectiveness and implementation of these plans. Looking at cross-border collaboration, our research found that all governments are involved in some form of regional response but specific protections for migrant workers are generally weak. Only Bangladesh, India and Malaysia coordinate with other governments to facilitate the repatriation of foreign victims of human trafficking. However, encouragingly, all Asian Commonwealth countries are involved in the Bali process on people smuggling, trafficking in persons and related transnational crime. On our fourth milestone of addressing risk, our research found that there is a requirement for laws which marginalize certain groups to be reformed and development and action towards corrupt officials. There is also a need for the extension of labor and social laws, as well as to address the root causes and drivers of human trafficking. All countries are making efforts to prevent exploitation through awareness campaigns. An example of this was in 2018 in Singapore, when Singapore conducted campaigns to educate workers on their rights and raise public awareness on exploitation. In Sri Lanka, the government partnered with the International Organization for Migration to launch a campaign raising awareness of human trafficking. However, unfortunately, our research also found that there are weak social protections across the regions, which is a major driver of exploitation. This is because if individuals do not have a safety net, they are more likely to be susceptible to exploitation and trafficking if they cannot sustain themselves or their families. Our research also found that there is weak protection for labor rights. Only four countries have laws which require recruitment fees to be paid by employers rather than be paid by the employees. The Maldives is also the only country with labor laws that extend to all workers, both migrant workers and domestic workers. Bonded labor remains prevalent in the region, particularly in brick kilns and agriculture. And in India, government efforts to address bonded labor, labor remain insufficient in actively curbing this. Although national laws criminalize corruption in all countries, there were reports in five countries that official complicity in human trafficking was not always investigated in practice. This was seen in Sri Lanka where the government did not initiate any new investigations into allegedly complicit officials. Finally, looking at our 
fifth milestone of supply chains, this was the area that we found required the most improvement. There is a need to identify sectors at high risk of forced labor and collaborate through regional mechanisms. No countries have implemented laws or policies to combat forced labor in supply chains of businesses. Large economies within and outside of the Asia region continue to drive demand for goods and services which put individuals at risk of forced labor. This is something which is likely to only worsen as countries seek to restart economic growth after the COVID-19 crisis. So this is an overview of the research we have conducted and alongside this research, we have a set of key recommendations for governments in the Asia Commonwealth region, which I'll quickly talk about. On the first milestone of supporting survivors, we recommend that governments establish clear national guidelines and regular systematic training for police and other first responders so that victims can be properly identified and screened. On victim support services, we stress the need for the provision of adequate funding so that victims can get the help that they need. But funding isn't enough. These services need to be victim-centered so that staff are properly trained on how to support traumatized individuals. On our second milestone of criminal justice, we stress the need to strengthen existing national legislation to ensure that all forms of modern slavery and human trafficking are criminalized in line with international definitions and ensure that it is being enforced and implemented in practice. Alongside this, we stress the need to amend legislation and appropriately train law enforcement to ensure that victims are treated as victims rather than as criminals. On, on our third milestone of coordination, we recommend that governments establish a fully funded national action plan and coordinating, coordinating me mechanism to coordinate action on human trafficking between government agencies, as well as between the government and civil society organizations. On our fourth milestone of addressing risk factors, we recommend that governments extend labor laws to ensure that all groups across all industries are covered, particularly migrant workers and informal workers, and ensure that labor inspections are regularly conducted across all sectors. With this, access to basic social protections such as education, healthcare, and financial assistance for all populations is needed in order to lessen vulnerabilities. On our final milestone of supply chains, we recommend that governments identify sectors that are at high risk of forced labor and work actively with businesses in those sectors to eradicate all forms of labor exploitation. So this is a quick summary of our research on the Asia region of the Commonwealth. And I do recommend that everyone keep an eye out for our report that will be launched on 31st July that will go much more into depth on these issues. Thank you very much. Anna, that was a wonderful overview of the entire region and we look forward to reading your report shortly. Um, just a reminder to participants, you could place your, any questions that you have for speakers in the chat box. Uh, we will be monitoring them and compiling these questions and uh, we will post them to our speakers at the end of the presentation. Um, our next speaker for this afternoon is uh, Mr. Virawit Tian Chainan. He is the Executive Director of the Freedom Story Thailand, and he is joining us from Chiang Rai today. Um, Virawit is a human rights advocate with over 20 years of experience working in various roles in Thailand. He has worked on the international stage with the UN High Commission for Refugees um, as Country Director of the US Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, and founder and executive director of the Thai Committee for Refugees Foundation. Um, today, he will be pre presenting the work of the Freedom Fund, working with very closely with communities and vulnerable populations in Northern Thailand, um, and presenting their work, which seeks to prevent uh, the phenomenon from occurring in the very first place. So um, over to Virawit. Thank you, Anila, for the uh, introduction, and thanks the uh, University of Essex uh, for inviting me to share what the Freedom Story has been doing in the north of Thailand in terms of preventing human trafficking. So in order to share with uh, the audience about what the Freedom Story has done, I would like to start by telling the story of how the Freedom Story started about 13 years ago. 
at that time, um, our founders came to Thailand from the US and conduct uh, documentary studies about the situation of human trafficking in Thailand. And one of the key results that uh, they found during, during the documentary theme was that a number of uh, victims of human trafficking were suffer because they lack uh, education. And because the lack of education opportunity, there was no way out for them uh, from human trafficking. So the organization was found on that concept that if we would be able to provide uh, education to those who are at risk of human trafficking, that could uh, prevent them from becoming a victim of human trafficking in the first place. So our program started with the scholarship program that we provide scholarship to those students who were at risk of human trafficking. And since then it expanded to cover other areas that we consider it to be the holistic model. So our program can be defined into three main programs. First is the activity and scholarship program, second the human rights program, and third sustainable livelihood programs. So the first program, as I mentioned, that we start by um, working with the community and the school to identify those students and especially girls who were at the high risk of becoming a victim of human trafficking. Because when the organization was founded, we realized that uh, in the north of Thailand, we had a number of uh, victims of human trafficking. And at one point in the district where we had our office established, we had at least one uh, former victim of human trafficking pass away because of the HIV infection. So it was very severe at that time. So we worked with the community and the school to identify uh, which girls would be uh, at risk. And then we work together with the families who want to keep their children in schools. But because the lack of uh, financial resources, they had to uh, pull out their children from the schools and then send them to work with the human traffickers. So we, we stopped by intervening into um, that chain of human trafficking and then provide scholarships and support to the family so that they can keep their children in schools. And since then, uh, over the past 10 years, we have children in our program expand to uh, over 150 students. And a number of them already graduated their bachelor degrees and became lawyers, accountants, teachers, and others' occupations. Also those who chose the professional careers, then uh, we support uh, the tuitions to learn to become chef, ballista, and others, which uh, significantly changed their life. So in the areas that they came from, many of the students did not even dream uh, to graduate bachelor degree because their lack of resources. But by showing that it's possible, it's actually uh, open up the opportunity for other students to be able to dream more about what they can achieve in their life. And by setting examples of uh, students from their, their communities who could uh, become uh, successful in their life, that is not uh, the result of the scholarship alone. We have the mentorship programs that our staff work closely with the children, the family, and the schools. And empower the students to build their confidence and training them on soft uh, skills so that they can have a higher self-confidence and learning other skills that they could not learn in the schools. So over the year, uh, we have had the opportunity to work with the communities and then uh, addressing this uh, problem from the root cause. So after 10 years, uh, it was encouraging to learn that the district that were once uh, having a lot of uh, victim of human trafficking was reported by the national uh, statistic report that there was no new case of victim of human trafficking in that district. And since then, we uh, expand our program to cover the whole Chiang Rai province. 
And this year we expand our program to another province, the Nan province, and then also working uh, broadly in the north of Thailand. Because uh, we, we have the evidence to prove that the prevention models uh, works. The second program that I mentioned is about the human rights program. We realized that what they need to know is about their rights and also to uh, learn about their rights and exercise their rights in order to get the protection and benefits from the government. Some of our students uh, lack of the Thai nationalities and they are stateless. And that is one of the root cause that contribute to the risk of human trafficking. So we have the program that work together with the families, students, and the communities to proceed with the, the uh, nationality application process. We have had a case of success and they are now having Thai nationalities that they can uh, enjoy their full rights. And we also work with the children themselves to learn about the risks of human trafficking that change over time. And the human traffickers uh, came in many forms and their families and the community, they need to be uh, up to date about the tricks that human trafficker will be using against the students. So we have our teams that go to schools and the community to conduct trainings on human trafficking awareness and also about their right to their body, to their safety, and also to uh, keep up to date about the, the tricks that the human trafficker use nowadays. If, when the COVID-19 starts, so we uh, were alerted that online, uh, online exploitations will increase. And as uh, we expect, uh, unfortunately, the number of online uh, exploitation uh, uh, increased quite significantly since the COVID start. So we uh, adapt our program to be more online and then educate the families, students about the risks of online exploitations uh, more. So in our human rights programs, uh, in the past two years, we expand from the type populations or those populations were in Thailand to cover the Maikan population as well. So this we work in partnership under the funding of the USAID to work with the Maikan workers to address the issue of labor trafficking. Because Chiang Rai is bordered with Laos and Myanmar, so a number of Maikan workers came into Chiang Rai uh, and many of them uh, were not aware of their rights and some of them were at risk of uh, labor trafficking. So we work in uh, providing uh, information and awareness about their rights as migrant workers in Thailand, whether they are documented or undocumented, and working together with them to address the issues of the labor exploitations. Some of them were not paid uh, by the employers or other form of abuse that helped happen uh, during their working in Thailand. And that could escalate to become uh, uh, rules by the human trafficker to go to work in other industry or different uh, places in Thailand. So we have been working that for two years and we have had a, a good number of cases that we help uh, during the past two years that can have their rights uh, recognized and have the remedies uh, uh, by the, by the government agencies or by the, by the employers. So the third program that we are working is the sustainable livelihood. In the sustainable livelihood, we uh, work together with the families who are at risk of human trafficking and by helping their children to study in school by providing scholarship, we work with the parents as well to provide them with the uh, income sources. Some of them um, did not know about the uh, organic farming or other uh, form of uh, agriculture that can generate high income. So we work with the specialists and then conduct the trainings and provide the capitals for them to start their business. 
and linking them up with the uh, social business and the community uh, so that they could access the market and then increase their income. So this is the holistic approach that we work to address the issues of the poverty and the lack of education of the students and their family. And we have seen that this approach uh, with a lot of focus and long-term uh, effort actually help uh, eradicating the root cause of the human trafficking in the first place. And we, we built on this by uh, telling the stories of, of these uh, successful cases and also uh, supporting those uh, students to tell their own story as well so that they would uh, be able to raise awareness and also share their life. And so that could uh, help other students and other families to learn about other possible way that can prevent them from becoming victims of human trafficking. So I think this, uh, maybe the first round, I would like to share this prevention model that the Freedom Story has done in the past 13 years. Um, and to prove that uh, prevention is possible uh, along the line of the protections and, uh, and criminal justice that uh, need uh, to be impressed as well. So yeah, back to you, Anila. Thank you, Vera, for that presentation. It was really interesting to hear about the community-based work that you're doing to address human trafficking right at the root causes. Um, I think your point too about increased online uh, exploitation since COVID was really interesting and maybe we can dig into that a bit deeper during the, uh, the Q&A section. So thank you. Um, our final speaker for this afternoon is um, Mr. Zhang Wen. Um, Zhang joined the BBC in 1999 after years of study and report in, reporting in Central Europe. He holds a master's in legal science from Warsaw University, was a fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford, and holds a master's in media and communications at Goldsmiths College, University of London. He has been instrumental in leading teams and launching programs across the Asian region, including um, BBC Vietnamese, BBC Thai, BBC Korean, and BBC Chinese. Um, he is a regular contributor to BBC News and other world services outputs on Asian current affairs and was the lead commentator for several UK and European-based programs about the death of the 39 Vietnamese migrants in Essex when the story broke in 2019. Um, we are honoured to have you and over to you for your presentation. Thank you, from Anila, for your warm welcome and thank you uh, to everyone. Uh, uh, for uh, joining me today. Um, I want to bring uh, you back to the story uh, on the uh, 23rd of October last year, when uh, the news broke about um, a lorry which was stopped by the police in Grey, Essex. I think not far from my, my home, I'm in Kent at the moment. Uh, and I will tell you how I traveled there to report for the BBC, uh, BBC News and the Vietnam Service later. But uh, in the beginning, uh, so, as you can see, the international character of human trafficking and migration means in the first hours, all the UK media outlets reported it, that there were supposedly Chinese uh, victims of human trafficking. But in the Vietnamese team, in the BBC, we were reporting that news as well, um, because um, you know, migration and human trafficking is, is uh, nothing new to us. But we were discussing, hmm, maybe there are some Vietnamese mixed up with the Chinese, because you remember back in 2010, uh, over 50 um, Chinese um, migrants were, you know, they lost their life at the back of a lorry from the Netherlands into the UK. Uh, but then, so because we are working very closely with the Chinese service, literally they're sitting next to us in the building, in the BBC headquarters in the new booking house. Uh, we were discussing with your Chinese colleagues and they said, hmm, apparently the, the, the trend of sending people into UK stock, you know, from Fujian province in China, they are going elsewhere, like Australia, even uh, the Pacific Islands. Uh, so we, we had some suspicion about the Vietnamese. So what I want to tell you is uh, a bit of our work. 
we checked the background of the victims. Obviously, we didn't want to know that they were Vietnamese, but then they came to us. Some of the victims' uh, family members uh, tried to contact the BBC Game Service via Facebook, asking questions like uh, they hadn't heard about their loved ones. Uh, I've come to two cases uh, in a minute. Uh, and do we know anything about that? Because we had reported, uh, you know, the, the loss of life uh, in Essex of, um, I think at the time they say about 34 Asian migrants, something like that. So it's not immediately about the Vietnamese. So we, we checked the background. We spent uh, almost two days uh, checking the background. And we match the time of uh, the two young people, Pham Cha Mi and uh, uh, Nguyen Đức Lựa, who had uh, left apparently Paris or um, Paris or Lille in France uh, for uh, their burgers. Now we know, but then for them it's just going to uh, Belgium, uh, you know, expecting to to get on the, on a lorry. Uh, so we, we, we were working closely with BBC News as well. Um, Daniel Townsend is one of the big names there, uh, covering security for BBC News. And uh, we decided not to inform the police in Essex yet, but we, we tried to check the background and then we literally broke news for Vietnamese and BBC News uh, on the same day. I think I remember it on Friday evening uh, that there were, or there may have been actually Vietnamese victims. And after that, uh, some of the newspapers in the UK reported, um, sadly, the last words of Pham Cha Mi when she was texting her mum, say, I'm sorry, mum and dad, uh, my uh, journey to a foreign land had failed. Um, she was literally uh, suffocating in the, in the lorry, now we learned. So it's a huge story for us. And uh, I went on BBC News uh, on, the, on the outlet in, in the next day, I think, at the two days of the weekend. I, I show you a bit of uh, a slide, let me share this with you. Um, can you see the, uh, you see the screen? Um, no, not yet. Oh, okay, let me see. If you use the share screen function at the bottom of your page, then it should show up first. So if I click on the... Uh, select window. So I will share the screen, but uh, let me get into it. Can you see? No, not yet. Uh, if, I know if someone can open it for me, uh, it would be great. There is the share, if you click on the share screen bottom, the green button at the bottom of your screen, then um, your slide should pop up as it did earlier. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, it hasn't. Okay, I, I keep talking. Um, Right. Um, if you'd like, I have your presentation. I could share yeah, the screen and then you, yeah, you speak yeah. on top of it. Yeah, yeah. Does that work? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, so I think I go to the second slide, please. So now I want to tell you a bit about the story of Pham Cha Mi, who, uh, who, who died at the back of the lorry and when they look. Uh, because we, we were talking to them directly, uh, to their families in Vietnam, after having got uh, the contacts uh, via Vietnamese uh, Facebook and social media. 
Uh, so uh, you see uh, on, on the left hand side is the, the, um, well, the shrine in Pham Chami's home with her mother. And then uh, uh, the uh, photo below is um, uh, the brother of uh, Nguyen Ding Le, uh, one of the victims. Uh, I spoke with um, the brother um, on phone and recorded his, uh, his, his, um, his, uh, well, his testimony, his statement. And on the right, you see Mo Robinson, one of the uh, key defendants in the trial, which is still ongoing. I think on the 22nd of July, some of them uh, were at the Old Bailey via a video link. And then in a small map below, you see uh, the, uh, the route going from uh, France to Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, UK, and Northern Ireland. So um, there's a whole network of um, illicit human trafficking involving many, many uh, nationalities. Um, now, the story of Pham Cha Mi, uh, which is quite telling, is uh, she was not just um, trying to get to the UK. Uh, as we, we have learned um, now, uh, before going to the UK via uh, Russia and Eastern Europe to France and uh, the Netherlands or Belgium, uh, she had been to Japan as a, a worker in, in, a, in a Vietnamese uh, Japanese company uh, for three years. And somehow she lost her job in Japan. So she came back home um, of feeling of a failure in, in, in her young life. And then the family um, put together the money, the funding to pay for the trafficker to help her to go to Europe. So you now you can see um, the, um, the the boundary between uh, an illegal migrants and a, a, a victim of human trafficking is quite blurred because uh, she she was um, a legal worker in Japan before, but then she came back home, couldn't make it, so she tried her luck again. Now, and Wendy Lung had a quite similar um, fate um, before he died. Uh, but he himself was in Paris for two years. So he left Vietnam almost three years before his death in, in, in England. Uh, he spent half a year in Ukraine uh, somewhere. Uh, his brother told me they didn't know. They just vaguely knew that he was spending time in a barn for half, almost half a year, waiting for um, the winter that year uh, to pass so they can walk over to Poland and then got on the back of a lorry and go to France. And he was uh, in Paris almost uh, two years uh, looking for a job somewhere in a restaurant, probably in, in, in Ch Chinatown in Paris. And then um, the family again arranged the money to, to, to be paid for him to go to England. But uh, I asked the family um, about the history, a bit of background history. They, uh, they had two brother, brothers who had been to Taiwan working already. So like the whole family of you know, three brothers traveling to various parts of the world, trying to, uh, you know, to seek a better life for themselves. And that is, uh, that is uh, so typical of um, the people from the same province in Hà Tĩnh in Vietnam. Because now we know that uh, out of 39 victims, uh, almost 25 comes from the same place. And that is, that is quite a big story for us uh, in BC Vietnamese service and in the BBC uh, news output. We try to send people there, uh, but the government in Vietnam uh, refused the visa. Jonathan uh, Head, um, uh, our correspondent for English in Bangkok, he was there uh, for just half a day and they just they kicked him, him out. So you can see uh, another dimension of the human trafficking story. When it, it breaks, a government may feel that you know the story like that, a, a tragedy, may um, shed light on some of the issues like corruption in the country. Because how all 39 people could got out of Vietnam easily? Uh, what passport did they have? You know, who issued the passport for them? And all sort of things like that. Uh, so um, yes, we we were working against sort of um, government censorship in Vietnam. We were just doing a job to cover news, but but the problem is the government uh, didn't want uh, to be seen, you know, in a they call it in a bad light, uh, especially when it comes to international news about Vietnam. So it's all about the image of the country. Uh, 
but uh, we learned that from the UK uh, government and FCOs in the UK embassy in Hanoi, they put a lot of pressure on the Vietnamese government, uh, trying to tell them that actually if you collaborate by working with us in identifying the victims and then bring them, bringing them home, uh, that would help Vietnam to almost improve the international image of the country and the Communist Party in Vietnam. Um, that's why uh, we were literally treading a very, um, very fine line how to balance the views from the Vietnamese government, who are always saying we care about our people, we cover on the cost for the government for the family victim to uh, to bring their loved one back home. Uh, but at the same time, we see you know reports from the family saying no, we haven't got any funding. You know, no one pays for for the victim to be sent home. So there are a lot of um, very careful um, uh, uh, reporting on the topic. The next slide, please. Can you move to the the, the next uh, slide, uh, the third one? This one, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the previous one, please. Uh, yeah. Um, now, um, another part of the story is about the Vietnamese in Europe. Uh, so we have covered um, the news from Essex. Actually, some Chinese and Vietnamese came there to pay uh, tribute to uh, to 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 uh, the. Um, um, the victims in Essex. And then we invited in the middle uh, um, image, you see one, um, one um, uh, Vietnamese um, gentleman sitting in a BT studio with a cross. And he was telling us a story of himself being trafficked into the UK, also at the back of a lorry. Now, but he came here for a reason. So what I want to tell is, uh, people have varied a reason to come to the UK or to Europe. Uh, he claimed that he was um, he was uh, persecuted for his Catholic faith in Vietnam, and he came here because he couldn't practice uh, his religion in in uh, in a village in the countryside of Vietnam. Uh, and obviously, he now uh, he 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 he's, um, he has a, a status to stay in the UK. Um, and then on the right, you have um, is a small image where you can see uh, he's the owner of a nail bar in Oxford. Uh, most of the Vietnamese come to the UK for two sort of profession, if you like. Uh, uh, the women are working in nail bar and um, the gentlemen, the, the boys, are working mainly in cannabis factories. So that clearly, they are li illegal uh, practice of recruiting people, but we ask uh, one owner who is fully legal and he only recruits people with um, you know, proper documentation. He he said yes, there are many nail bars in in England or Scotland uh, whereby uh, the Vietnamese are recruited illegally. So if you are illegal, you can work as a back shop, you know, like preparing the sets for making. Um, the, you know the nail work in, in that industry, but then you are not in the front shop to to see the customers. So there is a way of working around that. Um, and we interviewed um, a reporter from Paris. And she she came to the UK. It's a little uh, little uh, She was helping uh, Lucy Williamson from BP News of uh, uh, discovering uh, the whole route of people from Paris going up to the border of the UK uh, on the, on on the Calais side and trying to get on the lorry at night. So there's a huge network of, um, of people um, uh, across Europe, literally from Moscow to Paris and to, uh, uh, to London to help the human traffic, uh, to bring people here for, for profit. So that is a, a huge chunk of work for the police. And, but for us, we just want to report on what is happening. We try to make the reports correct and we try to, in some sense, uh, help the potential victims of human trafficking by telling them, actually, it's not that rosy. In, uh, if you are here working in a sweatshop in a carriage factory, you put your life in danger. And a lot of young girls may end up in prostitution as well. 
So um, that is our job. Um, but uh, otherwise, I, I don't see um, a lot of improvement in this because uh, still, certainly, we are still having a story in planning, which is going to Berlin. Because in Berlin, there is a huge Vietnamese community and there are the markets where people are working, helping with um, selling of fruits or food. But because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Germany, um, many of the shops are closed. So there are like 500, 600 people, uh, Vietnamese, they lost their job in Germany. And they are literally waiting to get on another lorry to go to, to come to the UK in the coming months, we don't know. Uh, so we arranged some meeting with the BT in Brussels and in Berlin, to trying to maybe to get into that story. Because that is the job we want to do. Uh, I have more to tell, but I can, you know, wait for the Q&A session. Um, thank you. That was really helpful and probably something for us to be keeping an eye out for um, in the days to come. Um, we will probably start our question and answer round. We invite attendees to please um, send in questions for the panel in our chat column. Uh, we're going to start with a couple that we received. Uh, the first is for Hannah. Um, has the Commonwealth Secretariat put pressure on member states to curb trafficking, protect victims, et cetera? And if so, to what effect? And further, what is CHRI doing to get trafficking on the agenda for CHOGM 2020, 2022 sorry, in Samoa? Um, and I'm just going to give you a second um, to think about that. And I pose a question to Shovita, which we received. It says, um, to what extent does the Hindu caste system play a role in South Asia, particularly in India and Nepal in human trafficking? and to employ and engage the untouchables into forced and bonded labor, such as man manual scavenging and temple prostitution. Um, yes, so basically the social economic vulnerabilities due to the Hindu caste system. Um, Hannah, if you would like to go first. Thank you very much. And thank you to my fellow panel members for everything they said, it was very interesting. So on the Commonwealth Secretariat, um, this has become an increasing issue for the Commonwealth Secretariat, resulting in human trafficking and child exploitation being included in the communique from the 2018 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, or CHOGM. Um, in that communique, what was stressed on human trafficking was that uh, governments from the Commonwealth needed to ratify um, international agreements on human trafficking, as well as create national strategies to combat human trafficking. And there was an emphasis on online child sexual exploitation and that governments needed to join relevant international bodies and initiatives. Um, this, th there was nothing specific on the protection of victims per se. Um, and this was a more general uh, stressing of the issue of human trafficking in the communique. So in terms of com the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that is upcoming, uh, we will be at, well, it, it remains to be seen, Chogam has had to be moved because of COVID-19, so we'll see what happens. Um, but tentatively, it could happen in 2021 um, with the Rwandan government, as was supposed to happen this year. Um, we're planning to attend Chogam, and we're planning, hopefully, to bring members of the Commonwealth 8.7 network with us to talk about their own work in their Commonwealth countries they're coming from and stress what they need in terms of, com in terms of their own governments. Um, we're hoping to have a side event so that we can maintain the momentum from the London Chogam on this issue. Um, we're hoping to share the report that we'll be launching this month as well. Uh, which will hold governments to account for their actions on human trafficking. And we're hoping that by going there with the network, we'll, ha we'll have a collective voice by which to advocate on these issues and to keep the issue on the table when it comes to the Commonwealth. A couple more questions come in. So, um... 
uh, one for Virowit. Uh, do you think how far or how far do you think preventative programs can go in Thailand? Uh, while the government tends to focus on other types of exploitation and other and other other groups of victims, especially migrant workers, do you think it may be that Thai victims uh, could be at risk again, as they may have received uh, attention less attention from the government? Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think for us, uh, I think we believe that prevention uh, works. And as the counter trafficking in persons uh, pillars, I mean, one of the pillars is the prevention pillar. And because we have the successful cases uh, in terms of the preventions uh, and the awareness raisings, I think that is, uh, can be proven that it can work, but it requires a lot of resources and long-term investment to make uh, the result uh, and the impacts that can be shown. What uh, we have been advocating is not the isolations of the prevention program. We believe that it has to work in conjunction with the protection and prosecution as well. So um, the, the issues that now the governments uh, want to focus on other aspect of uh, counter uh, trafficking um, I think more and more we have uh, discussions about the prevention, uh, not, not only for the Thai populations, but also for the uh, migrant workers uh, who came into Thailand as well. Uh, actually, just before this session, I had the opportunity to attend the opening ceremonies of the police training on special investigation related to human trafficking and it was chaired by the deputy commander of the loyal Thai police. So I had the opportunity to chat with him over coffee about this as well. So he began to realize that uh, we need to work more on prevention because Thailand had been uh, working a lot on prosecutions and the number of cases uh, increased uh, over the years. And that's also coincide with the TIPS report that was just released that Thailand should be doing more on prevention. So I think that uh, is the reason why we need to uh, maybe put more resources and also planning in terms of the policy and the implementation on how we should be working on the prevention alongside the prosecution. So I, I don't think that the government is neglecting the, the prevention, but I think they're trying to bring in uh, prevention uh, into the policy more, uh, I think at, I mean, at the top level, yeah. And there was another question, maybe I would uh, also touch upon that related to the human trafficking in tourism, because I think that's very much related to Thailand. So it's, this issue is very high on the agenda in the, in the Thai uh, government. And the Freedom Story work with other partner NGOs and also the business community to tackle the issues of human trafficking in tourism industry in Thailand. So there are a number of uh, uh, campaigns uh, launched by the government, uh, especially by the uh, Ministry of Tourism on, uh, on warning the tourists about uh, human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children in Thailand. So the Freedom Story worked together with the uh, hotels and also other NGO partner to establish a program called uh, Chai Safe and Fairly Tourism in Thailand. And that's, we work with the hotels uh, in Thailand and all the big chains and also the small and medium size uh, to train all the staff in those hotels about uh, human trafficking and how to identify any potential cases or victim of human trafficking that can come into their uh, business and how to report that to the, the special branch of the Thai police on human trafficking. So there's a, a ongoing uh, cooperations in terms of uh, tackling the issues of human trafficking in the tourism industry in Thailand and we are uh, using the uh, multi uh, partnerships in terms of uh, addressing that issues. Yeah. Thank you. And just uh, for sake of time, a final question um, for Yang. 
When covering stories of victims of human trafficking, uh, how do you ensure that it's done ethically? Should I repeat? Yeah, yeah, the last bit. Yeah. Right into, yeah. Uh, yeah, so when covering stories of human trafficking and other vulnerable uh, groups, how do you ensure it is done ethically? Well, first we respect um, people's identity. So if you look at the BCB and Miss Service website uh, and some of the BC News um, stories, uh, we have the, the face of the uh, speakers blurred, um, or we just film them at the, um, their back. Um, and uh, sometimes we have to change the names because um, that is, uh, I have to tell you, this is quite a dilemma because some people come to the UK illegally and they frankly, immediately, they post all the photo of themselves you know, enjoying a new life uh, in, in London, although they are illegal, they can be uh, arrested anytime. Um, so it, um, I try to understand them because they want to, to send a message of being successful you know, to, to their friends and families, but they don't know that uh, Facebook pages can be this is traced, uh, tracked down by anyone. And now when we approach some of them, they want to talk, but then they realize that uh, actually maybe not a good idea to, to tell the full story or the, uh, show their names. So we always uh, literally double check before we even broadcast anything. Are you sure you want to, uh, your name to be there, um, your face or photos? Um, so one of the story we just uh, broadcast the audio interview with a woman who are now legal in the UK, but uh, she didn't want people, you know, her friends or family knows about the ordeal she had been through uh, in, in continental Europe. Uh, so that is the way we, we treat uh, the victims. When we approach, uh, approach the police, uh, it's, it's very interesting to know that, uh, you know, when the police in, in, in Britain talking about um, uh, cannabis factories, it's already like um, criminal activities. So we have to uh, literally challenge them. You know, some of the children in, uh, they, they, they arrest may, may be the victims of human trafficking. Uh, and now the police are obviously, they, they're, they're working much better. They, they assign um, uh, spokesperson to, to speak with us, and some of them you can see on a BBC program, um, they use uh, the right language. But I remember seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, uh, a police station in Edmonton, North London, literally invited us to, to, to join them in a raid to a canvas factory. Uh, and we went along, but obviously we didn't go into uh, the premises because it was dangerous, and a BBC lawyer didn't want us to go, go in. But we, we, uh, we saw the victim in the police station. And uh, again, it's on our side, I share a bit of the tips uh, when we work in the BBC, because we have very rigorous uh, guidelines. Um, we saw that, you know, we filmed uh, the, uh, the, in, the, the interiors of uh, the house where we were staying, and there are lots of Vietnamese language newspaper on the floor. <laughs> and we couldn't, we couldn't broadcast it now, uh, because that would identify uh, those people as Vietnamese. Uh, so we couldn't do it until the court said so. So it's a lot of work like uh, you, you see how we are doing and it's just interesting to share, to share but uh, we do it very carefully. Yeah. Thank you so much and just in respect of everyone's time I think we'll wrap it up there but I um, wanted to say on behalf of myself and the rest of the Human Rights in Asia Conference Organizing Committee uh, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us today and this week, and a special thank you to the speakers uh, today for their thoughtful presentations and the really interesting discussion that's come about. Um, we'd also like to take a quick moment to thank Matthew Capes and Catherine Gentry of the Essex Human Rights Center uh, events team for their continuous guidance and support throughout this whole process, uh, as well as a big thank you to uh, Sine Vujita, whose passion for this event has really helped us forged through even despite the uh, added difficulties of COVID. So thank you again, everyone, and wishing everyone a great week.